For this first inaugural edition, my guest is the one whose dream was some years ago Cardano itself. It's visionary founder, Charles Hoskinson, CEO of IOG. You may have met the deep thinker, the fierce entrepreneur, the blockchain pioneer, the witty personality, or the visionary leader, as Charles has so many facets. But today we will meet Charles the dreamer and explore his dreams for the world, for Cardano, and for himself. We want to talk about his dream come true and what's left still on the bucket list. And hopefully we will have time for a few side chains into other hot topics from Charles' interest. So Charles, welcome to the podcast. I recall you saying at the start of a keynote, it was more or less of an address to the community in the beginnings of Cardano. I quote, we are Cardano, and if you'd allow us, <laughs> we'd like to change the world. That was a few years back. Do you think, or did you ever think that they will ever allow us, Charles? Do you think that we can change the world by asking for permission? <laughs> well, uh, you never really get anything done in life unless uh, you have a, a tireless minority uh, that uh, is willing to light a few brush fires here and there and piss some people off. There's a great book. It's called The Courage to be Disliked. Uh, y y you know, people get comfortable with the way the world works. And uh, if you have no technological progress or social progress, that might actually work for a while. You know, for example, in Europe, there were some tombs uh, that they exhumed that are thousands of years old, and they, they found an axe head inside one of the tombs, and then they compared it to the design of Paleolithic ruins and axes, and there's not much difference between the two. So there was thousands and thousands and thousands of years of human existence where technology stayed flat or regressed. it kick up a little bit, but then it go down. Like the times of Charlemagne, uh, the king was a traveling court, and there was probably a thousand people. Largest city in Europe was tens of thousands of people. Time of the Roman Empire, 500 years before, millions of people lived in Rome. So it just shows you how the world works. So one of the things about change is, is the first truth is to realize that every human being has built within them the raw potential to change the world. It's just a belief that they can do so in their own way sometimes small, sometimes big. Uh, Rosa Parks probably didn't think that she was going to become a, a titan in the civil rights movement. She was just frustrated about the indignity of having to be, not be allowed to sit uh, where she wanted to sit. She's a human being and was demanding her humanity. You know, so there's, there's plenty of cases like that. Uh, so with cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology, really what we're selling here is a different way to construct institutions. You spent a big chunk of your life thinking about systems and complexity and you know these things and have some great publications and uh, you know, but at the at the core of all of it, when we think about complexity, usually we construct institutions to manage it and make decisions given it, its existence. But institutions rely upon faith and trust. You don't go to a hospital if you think everybody dies at the hospital, but you need the hospital to do surgery. So you have this, this constant need for legitimacy in order for an institution to do the job correctly. And every time there's major social change, institutions lose legitimacy. So, for example, uh, during the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church said, we're God, we know everything, the Pope is infallible. But then how do you say that with a straight face, say you speak for God, but then when the Black Death comes in and the Pope himself dies of it? I was like, if you're on God's side and you guys are cool, then uh, you, you know, priests and kings alike and these other social structures, they shouldn't really be contracting the plague. The plague is a curse from God. So obviously God is very angry, you know, and the whole Avignon papacy collapsed and they had to move back to, to Rome. So whenever you have a crisis of confidence in institution, that is the invitation for mass social change. And in that case, it gave us the Renaissance, which led to the Enlightenment. The case of Russia and the turn of the 19th, 20th century, the destruction of the czarist policy led to a dystopian communist regime. So there's no guarantee that social change will be positive always. It can, of course, be negative, but these are inflection points in the arc of history. And we're at one right now. 
where we have to make a decision of how do we handle the fact that our institutions are at an all-time low in credibility and trust, and how do we handle the consequences of globalism, and the third category, which is existential concerns, which is something unique to the human race. Every century prior to the 20th, we didn't have the ability to wipe out the planet. Then suddenly nuclear weapons were invented, now we do, and all, twice that we know of, we almost it got wiped out. And it was literally one person who made the decision for the entire human race. In the case of the Cuban Missile Crisis, the first officer of a sub, he refused to turn his key. The captain already had. And in the case uh, in the 1980s, it was a Russian colonel who they had just installed a software upgrade and, and it had a glitch and it made it look like the Americans were launching weapons at them. And his training was saying you should launch the weapons from your silo, which would have provoked a nuclear war between the United States and Russia. In both cases, one guy was like, yeah, maybe we shouldn't end the world today. Not not so good. And that's just one existential technology. And when we look at the 21st century, we have nanotechnology, you know, we have environmental concerns with global warming, you have gain of function research, you have artificial general intelligence, and dozens of other potential existential technologies. And so the, the problem is that not only are they increasing horizontally in that the categories of existential technologies are increasing, but vertically in that the accessibility of these things is increasing. And in the context of this, Charles, what would be your wildest dream for yourself, for Cardano, for the world? Where we're going with this is that we are at this inflection point and we see the challenges. The, the inequality, the, the, the problems with globalization, the billions of people that are left out, and the proliferation of existential technologies that if left unmanaged, the probability of one of these killing the entire human race is very high. You know, so, so given that those are the challenges, every person has to take a step back and say, well, are we going to just proactively try to solve the problem, or are we going to hope that other people are just going to figure out how to solve the problem? If you believe in freedom and liberty and you want to live in a free, enlightened society and you want to have self-determination in your life, you can't risk the second option of that somebody is just going to figure it out for you because probably what they're going to do is embrace a legacy solution, which is hyper-centralization of power. And a very small group of people will have the total ability to control everything. So you ask, what are my dreams and hopes? Well, I, I would hope the better angels of our nature, you know, to, to quote uh, Steven Pinker, I, I, I believe in the best in people, and I believe that people, if they're inspired and brought up and given an opportunity to be their best, will become that. And so I believe that the tools of liberty and freedom can uh, be, be used to solve the challenges, which are much worse in the 21st century than I would argue even in the 20th century. Yes, and from the very beginning, you envisioned Cardano and IOG products to be designed as a synergetic force for doing good in the world. And, you know, you inspired so many of us, me included, uh, from the very beginning to believe in, you know, this kind of worldless magic effect, that cascading effect, that the systems of the world will be pushed to that brink where at the tipping point, and the, the change will happen seamlessly. So my, you know, my question to you, because, you know, looking at what's going on in the world now, Eastern Europe, North America, uh, I think it's more or less everywhere. My question to you is, do you know who said this? There are abundant indications that the society that produced homogenized milk will soon produce homogenized men. It was in the 60s, early 60s. Homogenized people? Was that Ludwig von Mises? It is a chapter in this book. And the book is by Paul Getty, How to Be ah. Rich by Paul Getty. So, so Getty, you know, in this context, yes, he saw himself as a dissenter and an anarchist. And that's coming back to my initial question is, will they ever allow us? Because as you mentioned, it seems like the systems of the world are entrenching us even more in the old ways of doing things, and they are not going to give up easily. Right. So the main question is, does your mission to change the world make you an anarchist and a dissenter, Charles? Well, I mean, it's an American tradition to go and uh, challenge institutions and tear them down and rebuild them. And uh, we've done it for ourselves. We did it for the world. Uh, and I'm just following in those footsteps. I'm not here to make people happy. I'm often offensive to people. And there's plenty of people that just think I'm the worst person alive. 
And, and there's plenty of people who think I'm a great guy. You know, it's not about that. It's, it's, uh, it's about principles and the belief of humanity. And I see the problems. Others see them as well. And we have a common interest in, as a collective society to solve them. Because if we don't, the consequences of not are, are catastrophic. Uh, so we are challenging as a species everything right now. What does it mean, liberty and freedom? What are, what are human rights? Uh, when does the right of the individual have to take a backseat to the right of the group? COVID is a great example of that. We've created a second-class citizen with COVID. They say, well, if you're unvaccinated, you can't go to the hotel, you can't go to the restaurant, you can't travel. And they say, well, that's for public protection. And I say, well, okay, well, what are the, if we're going to go down that road, then what criteria are you putting in and how do you equally apply that standard to everybody? And we can't even get an answer there. Uh, you know, they just say, well, no, it's public protection. So, okay. Uh, and so, so when you see this, this language of authoritarianism and you, the comfort that some people have stripping the rights of freedom of association, expression, and commerce from, from individuals for the collective good without a clear mandate on defining objectively what that collective good is and having oversight to that process— uh, that's concerning. It's deeply concerning. So I think the default state of affairs is intolerable for everyone, not just me, but everyone. And everybody has their threshold. So some people say, well, it's okay for me, but if you're doing something to my children, that's wrong. Or it's okay for me, and maybe I'll agree the children are okay, but then other thresholds can exist, like maybe freezing of accounts and sovereign seizing of assets or these types of things or declarations of martial law. So we all have our, our sacred... Uh, milestones. And once they get crossed, you, you, you it's no longer optional. You just have to do something. And we're watching that in the world, which is why there's so much unrest. And there's, as I said, so little faith in institutions. I believe that it is uh, incredibly important that every day we in our industry, the blockchain industry in particular, say, look, we're an aggregation of a lot of great thinkers from the past, the systems theory people, the cryptography people, uh, the internet people who talked about the free flow of information and the social consequences of this. Okay, so the Arthur C. Clarks and, uh, and the uh, Whole Earth Catalog a crowd from the 70s and the 50s and so forth. And because that's evolved to a point where it's useful, we now should be in the conversation and we should be evangelizing the reconstruction of institutions. But going from abstraction to specifics, people often get lost. So one example I love giving is there's a lot of people that seem to feel the U.S. voting system is broken. If you're on the left side of the spectrum, then in 2016, a big narrative was Russia co-opted the elections and took over everything, and uh, Putin basically put Trump into office. There's so many people that did that. I mean, Saturday Night Live, every week, they had a guy pretending to be Putin and Alec, and, uh, Alec Baldwin playing Trump and that whole relationship. He's an agent provocateur, a Manchurian candidate. Then in 2020, you know, Trump people said, oh, the elections are incredibly corrupt and how did Biden get all these votes and so forth? So there's a bipartisan agreement, just depending on who's in office, that the voting systems are corrupt. Why can people get away with these allegations? Because at the end of the day, if you're a voter in America, you have no way of verifying your vote was counted, counted correctly, and the integrity of the election system as a whole. It's completely faith-based. You have to trust institutions, the very same institutions that have lied to us again and again and again, from the Iraq war to other things. And we're like, wait a minute here, we've seen the wizard behind the curtain. He's, he's not a 12-foot-tall guy. He's four feet tall and in terrible shape. Okay, let's, let's be clear here. So then you say, well, blockchain institutions can change things. Well, how would it do that? Well, you can verify your vote. You can verify your vote was counted correctly, and you can verify the integrity of the election system without trusting any institution. And no, no dictator in the world would ever want a system like that, but a free society should demand that. And then you go through every institution, credentials, payments, monetary policy, voting, all supply chain. You eat food. How do you know the food is not contaminated? You're in Flint, Michigan. You're drinking water. How do you know there's not lead in the water? We need the ability as members of a free society, that when claims and assertions are made that impact our consent, our money, our lifestyle, that we can verify that people are being honest and we have a high degree of trust in the institutions that assist us in that. That's fundamental 101 stuff. You can't live in a free society if, if you lack these things. You can only live in an autocratic society 
if you lack these things. And we're increasingly moving in that direction, unfortunately, in every country. Exactly, because I, of course, I, we heard your call so many times for this. Yes, we live in the free society. What are you people doing? You know, but how ready is the world? How ready are people for this? You know, they, just just again from from this amazing book. It's a small book, but it's amazing. Paul Getty was saying, you know, that we live in a structured conformity, which is cushy. And the complacency plague is going further and further into society. He even notes like how this is very appealing to those completely bereft of courage and imagination who bask like some somnolent embryos in the amniotic comfort of a completely regulated life. So there are so many who have been, I don't want to call them brainwashed, but enregimented in the web of uh, regulation and bureaucracy who um, ha are stripped by any kind of, you know, uh, creativity, desire to, to change things and, and whose um, complacency we disturb, actually. People have to be first willing and able to change. And it's very easy for people to complain about others. You see this a lot, you go to college campuses, you see the kids with the blue hair and they're like, the whole capitalism is wrong and the system is wrong. We have to tear it all down and rebuild the institutions. And I'm like, it, Jordan Peterson points this out a lot. You can't even make your own bet, yet you assert to know how to run the entire global economy and what the definition of fairness is and so forth. You have to change yourself before you can change others. So you have to learn empathy, you have to learn how to listen, you have to learn how to love people and not have this transactional relationship where love is contingent or uh, emotional support is contingent on them giving you something back. That's step one, is self-evolution and the growth of self-wisdom. This is exactly what you impersonate and you manifest for me and for many of us, Charles. And again, to quote from Getty, I do not know why I kind of really was so impressed because I visited LA and his villa recently. He declared that truly successful people rely on four qualities imagination, originality, individualism, and initiative. And you, you are such a maverick, uh, definitely. But what I see in you, and which I think Getty may be considered like, like it's like, goes without saying, is also another quality, which is courage. You need courage to stand up to the systems which want to be preserved and will not want to change. So courage to challenge the old, my question to you is, in this context, what are your driving values, principles? Do you have a true North, like <laughs> clearly defined, or this is who you are, right. simply who you are? Well, we talk about the stages of development so you can influence social change. So first step is that awareness of the moment and the capacity to listen, and then that creating love for others and just a joy of the moment. Then that doesn't solve life because you still have to have meaning. This is what Viktor Frankl was talking about and, uh, and others were talking about and, and about this concept of a search for meaning, a way of life, this icky guy. Um, and, and so then there are the principles that guide you and the values that guide you. This is what the Stoics were talking about, the Senecas of the world and the Aureliuses and so forth. And so you really need a merger of those two. You, you need a, a strong set of values and there's modern discussions of them like uh, Rawls's uh, theory of justice. Uh, but basically, you have to decide how people ought to be treated. And, there's, and some of these things the, uh, are, are not rocket science. Like a, a pretty good principle to live life by is this concept of reciprocity in that you treat others as you would desire yourself to be treated. So be honest with people. Treat people like human beings. Invest in people. Uh, delight in people's growth. Find mutual wins. Never look for win-lose situations or some zero situations. Look for mutual situations where everybody can rise together and build together. These are strong principles, what you are articulating, Charles. It's amazing. Yeah. And then the other thing is people, they tend to be in the Western world very brittle. You know, they said, if you violated any of these principles once in your life, you're now compromised and therefore forever evil and wrong. So you have to have not only a collection of values, you also have to have uh, an understanding that you're going to it's like Batman, uh, re you know, the, the Dark Knight Returns, where he's trying to trying to climb up the tunnel and he fails dozens of times, and eventually he figures out how to get up, 
and he gets out of the uh, prison. Well, the values are the same way. There's so many cases in life where you don't live up to the things you put on paper. We all have this problem. We all have bad days. We all have facts and circumstances that are a problem, but that doesn't mean that these things are useless, any more so than a diet is useless just because you don't lose as much weight as you thought you were to that, that week. The second side of his meaning, which is a very personal thing of, well, what is the definition of a good life? And no one gets to decide that for you. Your parents don't and others don't. And some of the, the, the most unhappy people I've ever met is when their destiny has been decided by others. You know, for example, I come from a family of doctors, and uh, I had to make a decision. Do I become a physician or do I go my own route? And I went my own route and did things very differently than my dad and brother. Uh, but had I gone down the medicine route, I probably would have been a pretty good doctor, but I would have been probably fundamentally unhappy as a person. So I'd have all these prestige and have these patients and so forth, but it wasn't the path for me. It wasn't the choice for me. I'd look at the, the world differently. So you have to find meaning in life, purpose in life, and then you have to pair the guiding principles of that meaning, of how you get there via your values, because the values are how you navigate the roads and what decisions you make as you travel towards the direction of your life. And then your attitude is basically what you do while you're on that road. So your awareness of things, the companions you bring along, the standards and boundaries you have with those companions and so forth. And uh, boy, I've made a lot of mistakes along the way, and some are documented, some aren't. But yet at the end of the day, I'm 34 years old, I'm happy. I love my life and I'm surrounded by wonderful people. I, I take the time. The other thing is when you get big, if you do succeed, I will point this one out, uh, most people won't see this kind of success, but if you do, surround yourself by things that don't care about the success. People often wonder, why do you have all these animals? Why do you have a ranch? Why are you a farmer? Why do you grow things? Well, the most honest profession in the world is growing crops. You can be a billionaire, you can be prestigious, have great credentials, you can do all these things. But if you don't water them, you don't fertilize them, they die. So your prestige, your history, your social status has nothing to do with your success there. If you want to see if a person's real or not, look at their garden. That's what Voltaire said, tend to your own garden. The other side of it is animals. They'll shit on you just the same, whether you're a broker or a billionaire, and they leave the same mess. Uh, and so they keep you grounded in a certain respect. So the other side is what do you do when you get there? It's like you have to also have these cognitive artifacts that remind you, just like the Roman general on his triumph he has the slave in the back of the chariot whispering into his ear, glory is fleeting. You, you, you have to understand that the greatness of the moment doesn't translate to the greatness of the life. The principles and methodologies and humility that got you there has to be preserved in order to keep it. You are an idol and an inspiration to many. Does Charles Hoskinson have an idol? Well, you, you know, what's so cool is that uh, I was able to actually, uh, with Cardano, create awareness for a lot of people that uh, I, I enjoyed and, and was inspired by, like Voltaire, for example, or in Basho and, uh, you know, th people like Gogan and, and Shelley. These weren't random selections where I was just going through like a catalog. Oh, that picture looks fun. You know, each and every one of them had some connection. Uh, Girolamo Cardano himself was this amazing Renaissance man because I was sitting there thinking in Japan at the time, what do we name a cryptocurrency? And I said, well, it can be both good and both bad, but it also requires brilliance and it does a little bit of everything. And Cardano was just, I'm surprised there's not a, like a Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio uh, you know, movie with Scorsese directing about the life of Cardano uh, because uh, he really was a Renaissance man in every sense. He could paint. Uh, he was really good with a sword. He was a doctor. He was a brilliant mathematician. He was a bit of a scoundrel. He kept getting kicked out of cities for gambling. Um, it, you know, he, he wrote math textbooks, but he stole some stuff for it. it he, he, was, he was the personal physician of the Pope, but was excommunicated, but still talked to the Pope after being excommunicated. I, I mean, it's just like, wow, this guy's all over the damn place. It's uh, one of the most interesting lives you could ever look at. So I thought a cryptocurrency, that'd be pretty cool. But I said, well, it's too much masculine energy. You need to balance it out. So you know, how do we how do we have a female? And then Ada Lovelace was just such a cool person. And she she lived at a time where women were in the room, but there they were there's old saying, you're supposed to be seen, but you're not allowed to speak. You know, so see, don't speak. And that yet she spoke. 
and she spoke in ways that most people didn't, and uh, she expressed herself in ways that, you know, carried ripples throughout the uh, years. She was a huge advocate of Charles Babbage and understood that computers were probably going to change the entire world, and this was in the 19th century. It, just think about that. That's there, It's so rare to have that kind of perspective in, 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 in Europe at that time period. It was a huge advocate for these things. And I even have some artifacts uh, from Babbage and Lovelace. Um, I collect them. So those are examples of people that inspire me. I, a lot of enlightenment thinking as well. I'm a big, I also really like um, Bertrand Russell. You know, he had this amazing life as well because uh, he did something most academics have a really hard time with. He admitted he was wrong and then went and found some other thing to go work on that was completely different. And he ended up being actually more meaningful in that thing than the first thing that he did. So he was part of this group of mathematicians that were trying to rigorously unite logic and set theory and math and arithmetic together in a way where everything became mechanistic. So he wrote this book called The Principles of Mathematics. I think it was Alfred North Whitehead. And uh, it was 1,000 pages to conclude that 1 plus 1 equals 2. But what they had done in the book is they built this corpus of, of, of stuff that, that very elegantly linked logic and set theory and arithmetic together so that then they said, okay, now everything can be expressed as a logical formula, and then what we can do is just turn the crank from the axioms and we can write algorithms, you know, not computer algorithms, but paper algorithms that will basically allow you to reduce everything mechanistically to something and definitively be able to say yes or no. Well, it turned out with the work of Turing and Kirk Girdle and others that math is not complete and math is not deterministic with its formulation, and it never can be with the formulation that we have. So a lot of people, they like David Hilbert and Whitehead, it was just devastating to them, this. And they really didn't do much more after uh, that failed agenda. Russell said, all right, well, I'm just going to go do analytic philosophy and become this titan in the field. And he had seven decades after that where he just wrote so much and thought so much, and he was such a brilliant guy uh, and uh, lived a very colorful life. So I was deeply inspired by that, and also the precision of thinking. There's a lesson in life that you have to be careful with what you say. Definitions matter. Logic matters. Uh, and the analytic philosophers have, have mastered that skill better than I think anyone else, and uh, even more so than lawyers who trade in ambiguity. You know, they, uh, th this is their thing. So I was deeply inspired by that. You know, I was also deeply inspired by the, the classics. Th there's just some amazing people there. Uh, you know, Seneca is an example of that. Cicero is another example of that. And just some of the things they were able to do in those ages, uh, memorizing a three-hour speech with Memory Palace. I mean, just imagine that. You know, you, you write the whole thing down. You memorize the whole thing. You go and deliver it word for word. No one today does that, but they did that. It was a common practice in the Roman Senate. Um, understanding human nature and the balance of power. There was a reason why there wasn't just one consul, but two consuls of Rome, and the dictator system was temporary, and being able to resiliently hold that for centuries was a pretty incredible thing. And then showing the rare circumstances when people could short-circuit the system, like the first triumvirate, and just imagining like the lifestyle of Pompey and Caesar and, and uh, Crassus, and uh, how they were able to kind of build this alliance and how delicate it was. And when Crassus died, it, it was inevitable that there was going to be a conflict between the two. There's, a, there's great stories there. And, you know, who knows who the people really were. As, as the ages grow on, we lose sight of the actual person, and people basically become stories. It's like That's uh, right. his Dr. Story. Ford. <laughs> yeah, history, right. It's like a Dr. Ford in Westworld where he said Chopin, Beethoven, and Mozart, they never died. They simply became music. Well, similarly, all these people, they, they never truly die. They've just become myth. And there's value in the story. And if you remember the story, it's, it's, it's something you can carry with you to avoid mistakes and also to, to emulate, in some cases, uh, and improve upon. So what will... Charles become? Well, I hope the legacy that I leave here is with the work. So the, we have all this blockchain technology, and the burden is on me if I'm going out here and telling you that we can change institutions to go and change an institution. So at the very least, I would like to see the developing world have economic identity. And by the way, one person can do that. 
Look at Norman Borlong. You ask about heroes. He's another one of mine. One guy saved one billion lives. Not million, billion. Why? Because he taught people how to grow stuff. And he was really good at it. And so he went to all these places where a fact of life was famine. And every year people would starve to death. And he helped them get to a point where they didn't. And over the course of his life, saved a billion lives as a direct result of that one person. So one person can influence and impact the life of billions. And so if we can figure out how to build institutions in a fair way, a meaningful way, and get institutions to change over, even if it's just one government, one city, one council, then that is the brick that you can then build the next brick on, the next brick on, and eventually construct something pretty remarkable. So this year, we're going to show microfinance and try to convince the world that this is the route we need to go. And if we pull that out, it will fundamentally transform the lives of millions who need credit. And if we can get identity on a blockchain, even in Ethiopia, we're starting to see this. There's a civil war going on. The people who are already enrolled in the PRISM system that we've deployed, they have a significantly easier time proving credentials. The people who aren't, it's impossible because the schools are closed or there's issues and incidents or it takes months of latency which means they can't get a job, they can't get admitted to a place and so forth. And that's today. And if we keep the faith, we keep the effort over the arc of a lifetime, it will transform the life of billions of people. So that's the legacy that I I would like to leave. And and, uh, it'll be judged based on the efficacy and whether it improved the human condition or not. And that's for history to decide, not me. And I think it's still early to determine the legacy of Charles Hoskinson. Definitely yeah. it is. So, so let's see what time will bring. I just wanted to, to remark that in how we choose our idols, it tells a lot about who we are. So, <laughs> I mean, you are definitely, <laughs> you have such a, you know, uh, potpourri of amazing scientists and, and thinkers. And, and I can see shades of each of them in who you are, Charles. And this is really, again, amazing. And I think it brings me closer to the authenticity thing, but especially the way in which you chose your idols and how does that reflect on who you are? My question is, you know, how, what, what brings you closer to your creativity core, to your most authentic self? Uh, is it reading uh, Bertrand Russell? Is it a walk in the park? Is it tending to your animals on the farm <laughs> or or petting your dog or maybe something else. Yeah, it's the whole shallow versus deep work thing or the and Stephen Kotler talks a lot about flow. So, you know, there's Cal Newport and Kotler and these others that talk about these things, but creativity requires space. It requires mental space or physical space or both and time. And it requires a surrendering of expectations. Uh, you know, uh, one of the hardest things for an artist to do is to paint, just start painting, just go out there and just like, okay, go be creative. You know, it's no, you have to sit and then you just play with things. And then eventually you find a thread and you start liking the thread and you start following the thread and whether it be creating music or painting or writing code or coming up with interesting business strategy, it's all the same in that space. So really it's just about being patient and creating space and giving yourself the time and taking yourself out of an environment where there's an expectation of performance. Expectations kill creativity. And and there's a great paradox in life that people think by doing that, that somehow it slows them down, or it means that uh, it'll take a long time to be creative. But the reality is, by just creating that space, what ends up typically happening is that you start focusing a lot once you've found the thread, and you end up being more productive and producing a larger, faster, better output uh, than uh, than before, you know. A great example of this would be you know Game of Thrones with George R. R. Martin, when there wasn't a lot of expectations with his work, and people didn't care too much. I mean, certainly the books were selling, but there was no television show or any of these things. He was had a pretty good output, and things were flowing like a river. And then after the show came and everything, you got to publish, you got to publish, you got to push, you got to push. It seems like he's doing everything in his power to not work on that, and he's very distracted for finishing it out the series because the expectations are so high. Had he wrote the whole thing before they made a single piece of content, yeah, he wouldn't have cared. I'm going to get you here with expectations with my next question. Any books waiting to be written, Charles? Well, you know, I've talked a lot about writing a book on governance with Tamara, and uh, we there's a lot of things we could do. Um, some of the his, my own personal history has been 
horrifically mistold. And so maybe, you know, I should correct the record at some point, but you know, that's ego talking more than anything else. But then I always have to separate my needs from the needs of the ecosystem and community. So, you know, I, I invest all this money in creating a center for formal mathematics at uh, Carnegie Mellon. Uh, well, what is the center trying to do? It's trying to convince mathematicians that they should formalize with lean instead of LaTeX or the standard mechanisms. Okay, great. Well, the burden is on us at that center to actually convince them why and what's the value, what's the benefit. So Jeremy Evigad, the professor who's running that center, is running a book called Lean for Mathematicians. Great. That's an example of an output. Same for Cardano. It's like, we, what is Cardano? We need a mastering Cardano book. So that has to be done. They're mastering Plutus. Be a Cardano developer. That has to be done. But then there's a meta question of the philosophy of these things. Why? Why do we do what we do? What's the point of that? And that is a book that needs to be written. And I've talked a lot about when and how to do that. And I'm waiting to see a little bit more of the success. I'm waiting to see a little bit more of the institution because right now I have a check that I can't cash. I'm saying that when these systems are installed, they're better than the legacy systems. I need to actually go install them, get some empirical evidence, and then I can talk about the successes and I can tell the stories of people whose lives have been transformed and changed. And I think it's much more persuasive in that respect. So it would be fun to, to write a book along those lines. And, you know, you kind of let things sort their way out. I also have diverse interests. Like we did discuss that I do work in biotechnology and medicine. My dad, brother, and I started a biotech company and we're building a clinic. And I do believe that healthcare as a whole in the United States is, is horrifically wrong. And so it's entirely possible that the book I end up writing might be talking about how to change the American healthcare system rather than how to you know, deploy blockchain technology here and there. Uh, we're doing a lot of work in synthetic biology. Like we work with a company called Colossal that I invested in. They're literally bringing back the woolly mammoth. It's not a hypothetical. It's happening in 2027. Mammoths are going to be walking around the world again, first time in 10,000 years. Well, once that's done, there's a profoundly difficult ethical question that has to be analyzed about, well, what does this mean now that we actually can program DNA to a point where we can bring animals back or create designer organisms? For example, the same techniques that can be used to make that mammoth come back can be used to make the mammoth miniature. You have a tiny mammoth called a tamoth, teacup mammoth. Okay, so so is that okay? Is that We do it with designer dogs. You know, what if we do that with people? Is that not okay? Where, where do the ethics sit? So this alone is such so catastrophically significant to humanity, both positive and negative. Um, there's also a moral obligation to pursue this technology because every day hundreds of species go extinct because of us. So it's about time we carry the load and bringing them back. We're destroying the environment, and so it's very important to do that. But then we have to have the discussion. So when you say, well, what should you write? It's like, well, there's so many things here from the medicine to the synthetic biology to, you know, statements about, uh, you know, also resurrecting forgotten knowledge, too. Like uh, one of the things that I'm very interested in, I went to Egypt, I've been to Machu Picchu, I've been to a lot of places where it just doesn't make sense how the ancients were able to build these things. Uh, you know, you look at the hypotheses people have and they don't really add up for scale. I mean, how do you build something where you have to cut these giant blocks with copper saws and every 20 minutes you have to lay one of them and you do it in a single human lifetime? There's something more to the story here. But but so I'm super interested in that. And it would be fun to sponsor some research for people to actually go and study ancient construction techniques and see if they can come up with some new things because it's a deeply understudied area. Big fan of constructed languages. Like I love the Sapir-Wolf hypothesis and you know, there's languages like Lojban and so forth. And it'd be really cool to continue exploring conlangs and you know, uh, do something there. So that's a book. So there's so much. And the problem with me is that I love all of it. And so how do I pick and choose, you know? So yes, yeah, so uh, there is life after, after Cardano for Charles Hoskinson. I wanted to ask you now, you know, just looking at all these possibilities, all, all your passions and everything, are there any regrets? that maybe you should have pursued something and you didn't. I have hundreds of regrets, you know, and, and, and so many things that I, I could have done better. And it's a, less a question of do you have regrets, and it's, in my view, more of a question of what do you do with regrets. So regrets are neutral. They're either going to be problematic because you lay in bed awake and say, oh, look at all the mistakes I've made, how bad I am. You have to forgive yourself. 
they can be human. positive. Yeah, exactly. They can be positive if you come up with a plan of how do I avoid making the same mistake twice? There's an old saying that uh, a mistake is a lesson if you commit it once. If you commit it twice, it's a choice. Uh, so uh, so that that's that's where I said, you know, I could have done things very, very differently if I could do it, uh, you know, all over again. On the other hand, the collection of choices I've made got me here today. You know, so so if I did it differently, maybe I'd be in a completely different place in life and, and not we, have the experiences have that I met. have. Yeah, we would have never met. Maybe I wouldn't exist. Cardano wouldn't exist. Who knows? You know, so you can't you can't just play, oh, well, it is what it is. You just have to love them for the moments they are and, and say, all right, well, what am I doing differently today? You know, I learned early on that I have to communicate differently with people. I learned early on that sometimes I dominate too much in a conversation in a room and I have to moderate that at all times. I, I, you know, I have this view of myself. I'm just Charles. But then I'm starting to realize that other people view me very differently. In particular, the fans, sometimes they get very nervous when I meet them. It's a weird experience. You take a picture with somebody, their entire body is shaking as if they're meeting a saint or something. And it's so alien and foreign to me. And so I, I had to learn early on, how, how do you de-escalate that, make people more comfortable in their own skin and so forth? Uh, so there's all kinds of tricks there. So plenty of regrets, uh, plenty, plenty of things that I wish I could get a do-over. The MetaMask tweet, one of the greatest examples of that. I was sick in Vietnam, not doing well. We were just about to launch a product. And you know, the MetaMask team is not exactly the nicest and uh, most humble team in the world. And, uh, and I tweet at them and they're like, oh, use our support email. I'm like, really? really really you know and i shouldn't have had that response but you know we're human and we do these things and you know what charles there, there is a thing which i think it's like more or less a burden um uh, when you are in and this is my opinion <laughs> it will stay when you are superhuman you know there's so much expectation about you because i mean really uh, it, it, you you definitely impersonate like, like uh, beyond being human in so many instances and then suddenly you become human and everybody is like oh oh <laughs> you know like a shock wave so yeah i just wanted to give you an, just one example about what jordan peterson who i met actually uh this week mentioned about his daughter i met her as well and and he said well she was on tinder and just swiping no 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 the guys and it's like she has definitely genocidal tendencies but i know because <laughs> she's human so he was looking at the poor guys swiped like that he's like this is a person don't you think <laughs> so it's like yes we are humans and 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 just to accept ourselves like that but now i just want in the end to switch it to a, if you can recall one of the dearest and happiest times of your life. You know, recently I was up at my ranch and uh, I just we just finished the road that was up to one of the mountain peaks where we put up this big microwave tower. Uh, and uh, and I had a, two weeks off. And so I was like, oh, this is a lot of fun. My brother was there. My dad was there. And, and so I, I went alone up there and uh, on my ATV. And I just sat on this rock and I looked around and it's just these beautiful mountain vistas, all these trees and these other things. And... I had this incredible moment of peace uh, while I was up there and satisfaction, you know, because it, it, it wasn't that it was just so profoundly beautiful. It's just that it's a blank palette and an acknowledgement that I have my own personal Monticello. I can go and rebuild this and add to this and change this. Uh, and since that moment, I, I always go back to it. And I think, well, I just had a conversation with a geothermal company and we're talking about drilling this big geothermal well. That means I can have hot springs and heated driveways and energy generation from geothermal. Then obviously the mammoths, when we bring them back, I'm negotiating to see if we can get some of them on my ranch. So we found mammoth bones on that ranch. Uh, it, they, they were there long ago. Well, they're gonna roam again for the first time in tens of thousands of years. You know, So that was a phenomenal moment. And it was a moment of hope for me about how truly open uh, the, uh, the world really is and how everything, if you let it, can be a beginning to something new, you know, uh, and how incredibly fortunate I am to have lived the life that I've lived. There was a moment um, years ago when I uh, was at Plutus Fest, and it was 2018. I, yeah, it was 2018, and uh, it was over in Scotland, and we we designed Plutus, and we'd made Plutus as a language so concise that we joked that you could fit it on a dinner napkin. 
And one of my employees, they, uh, they, they, they actually did it. And so I, w- I showed up for Plutus Fest and I was eating and they said, Charles, look at the napkins. And I look at the napkins, the entire semantics of Plutus were on the napkin. And I was just like, wow, th- this is so cool, right? And, and then, then people are actually now using that beautiful, concise language to build things on Cardano and those things are, are being launched and some succeed, some fail, but you know, they're, they're actually making real progress. And just the other day, uh, so I'm a big fan of a video game called Fallout 3 and, and one of the voice actors was Malcolm McDowell who was in Clockwork Orange and Star Trek 7 and all these other movies. He's the guy who killed Kirk in Star Trek 7. Uh, so Malcolm McDowell is just a phenomenal actor. He's in his 80s now. And, uh, and so I, I was always quoting a line from the, the character that he played in the video game, President John Henry Eden. It's like this. And it's like, when I was a real boy growing up in rural, when, when I was a small boy growing up in rural Kentucky, you know, it's that, that line. We always, and my, my uh, executive assistant, JJ, and I, we always go back and forth on that. Well, JJ, he's such a damn awesome guy. He actually got Malcolm McDowell to make me a video because he knew I was having a hard week. And to, to cheer me up, I'll send you the video. It's the craziest thing. Malcolm's like, oh, Charles, I hear you're having a hard day and cheer up. And, and he actually did the line. When I, you know, and, uh, and it's like, this is your president, John Henry Eden, straight to y'all hot. I was like, oh my God, it's Malcolm McDowell and he's doing this thing for me. But you know, just that moment of, of somebody could care so much about you and, and know you so well and you work with this person that they know you're having a hard week and to be able to do something like that and just give it to you, it's that thought is just so incredible. You are loved. And I wanted to say that from, you know, from how you shared your mo- most recent moment of happiness, I can, I can recognize again the, the creativity. The, yeah. So you are so endowed with imagination, creativity. It's not accessible. Maybe it is to everyone, as you say, and maybe your expectations for the rest of us are, are accordingly. But I just want to tell you that someone smarter than me said that all the problems in the world are just a result of a failure of imagination. So here you are, yes, with the happiest day in, in your life, which is filled with imagination, with how to envision that it, it can be this and that and hot springs and mammoths walking around us and us are among them. Of course, many other questions come like, will they dislocate us? Will we disappear? Will we become extinct when we bring the, the other species back? So that is a different conversation. Yeah, I have a policy. Only bring the vegetarian animals back. So at least they won't eat me. Like we were talking, hey, should we do the hast eagle? You know, and it's like, no, no, those are scary. Don't do hast eagles or saber tooth tigers or any of these things. Those are, those are too big and scary. But, but mammoths are quite nice. They're like fluffy elephants. And the first one, I, I hope we can name them Snuffleupagus and just have them kind of float around and brush them every day. Yeah, that, that'll be the, that'll be my, my, my biography that I write. You know, it, it says there was the Zen and art of motorcycle repair. You know, I'll have the, uh, I'll have the brushing your mammoth. It'll be my Zen, my Zen book that I write in my old age. And I think in, you know, just a, as a continuation to this, it reminds me of something I read recently in a post. I even do not know by who and what, but it impressed me so much, which says that, being successful in itself doesn't make you great. What makes you great is if you look back and give your hand and help someone else become great. So, and this is what I hear you say, be, you know, to look after those who you are carrying with you and so on and so forth. So how do you define success, Charles? Was there anyone who reached back and helped you? I've had dozens of, uh, of mentors throughout my life. Uh, I had people taught me how to do business. I had people taught me how to think about research and what is good research to bad research. We're surrounded by a lot of people. Some of the people have mentored me work for this organization, like Agalos Kiasis and Phil Wadler, yourself. Uh, and uh, I received great advice everywhere from every person. And, uh, and also, I, I, I looked to my dad and my grandfather. My dad, uh, you know, taught me how to be in person, a real person. And my grandfather taught me uh, th- to have courage. My grandfather grew up in Montana and a real poor family. They didn't really have anything. And they were all farmers and ranchers. And someone in the family lineage was an old country sheriff, 19th century. That's a pretty hard job. Go get those cattle rustlers. And my grandfather said, I want to be a doctor. And they're like, we're poor ranchers. It doesn't work that way here in Montana. So I'm going to be a doctor. I'm going to make it happen. So he married his high school sweetheart and he became a smoke jumper and 
in the 1950s and he jumped out of planes into wildfires and worked worked hard there but he saved his money and he went to medical school and then he ended up becoming OBGYN and delivered 4000 kids over his career including me you know so you know you, you look to that and you say wow look at the courage of that kind of life it was very easy just to be a rancher raise cattle and you know be a ranger and go in the forest and that's life it's hard to go on that crazy journey and be in all that risk and do these things, raise five kids, have a great family. But you know, that these are the kinds of anchors that I look to and it deeply inspire me. And they're by no means perfect people. They made plenty of mistakes, but you look at the successes and, and you learn the lessons there and you look at the mistakes and you learn the lessons there and you take and internalize them. And also you have to give it back. You have to mentor people. This is why I love the academic process so much. You know, we, we've witnessed a lot of graduate students become PhDs and like DNS Syndros. He was a first year grad student when he joined us. And now he's at Stanford with a postdoc and he's writing phenomenal papers and he has a great career. So you kind of watch them grow up in that system. And there's now 130 publications in our portfolio. You know, our, one of our flagship papers, GKL has 1400 citations. That's uh, that's what we call winning in the world. That's a good paper. And it's, it's just like Lamport's papers. I think GKL and Ouroboros will in 20 years, 30 years have an equivalent amount of citations to Lamport clocks, these types of things. But you leave a legacy there, but the legacy is useless unless it translates to the next generation. And you always have to be vigilant and ask, what are you doing to mentor? What are you doing to educate? What are you doing to teach? Medicine has this great tradition. There's learn, do, teach. Everything about being a physician goes in that realm. You're expected as a senior physician at some point in your career to teach residents or medical students or someone, to, maybe a junior physician, to mentor them because that's how you create greatness is a transference of the lessons learned and wisdom of the past to the next generation. Well, we try to embody those principles in uh, I.O. And, uh, and say when you join this organization, it's going to be incredibly hard work because we do very difficult things. We're dealing with very difficult concepts and in many cases with timelines that are deeply compressed. On the other hand, it's, it's work that if you do it will grow you as a person. It'll give you character, you know, it'll give you technical knowledge you didn't have before, access to thoughts you'd never thought before. And at the end of the day, if we pull off our mission of improving the systems of the world for everyone everywhere, then what it's going to result in is making people's lives better. For example, I did a TED Talk back in uh, 2014 in Bermuda in October. I'm going back this year in October to Bermuda to redo that talk. And instead of saying aspirations, what we're going to do, how we're going to, we're actually going to do it. We're going to do a loan real time to somebody using a stable coin on Cardano, using a network and invite all the people that have come with us on this journey from Africa uh, to actually come together and talk about economic identity and, and how we've achieved that. So that was promises made, promises delivered, but that wasn't me. You know, I'm the cheerleader and I'm taking the vanguard, but there's 600 people behind me and a community of 3 million people behind me that has tirelessly worked for the last six years in particular to get us there. And so you have to tell their story too and, and acknowledge that and bring them up because the stronger they are, the stronger the mission is. And So there are so many ways to reach back, you know, if I may, yes, from, from what I hear you saying and, and helping, even publishing an amazing uh, result which will help the future generation or coming back to where you were five years ago, reaching back to that time and where you are now and, and showing uh, practically this is accountability. There's so much, so much uh, that, that you have done, Charles. I wanted to, you know, again, bring uh, back uh, this uh, Getty book, which <laughs> I do not know why I took it as, uh, as my inspiration for, for this podcast, but I found so many things like he posited that richness is more a matter of character and philosophy of life and attitudes towards it, which is clearly what transpires from our conversation, Charles. So my question is, you know, what does it mean to be rich to Charles Hoskinson? You, you know, uh, it's crazy that people seem to believe richness is the amount of arbitrary units of currency that you have in your bank account. Some of the happiest people I've ever met are some of the poorest people I've ever met. I was in the Maasai Mara in Kenya, and I was talking to people there while on safari at Cotter's Lodge, uh, who they literally live in huts. Uh, it's 
that, that that's their existence. And God, they have no worries. It's just like it's so seductive, that lifestyle. You know, it's the world, all this stuff is going on. Ukraine is being invaded. You know, economy is not like a COVID. Here. It's as if none of that exists. And all they have to worry about is what do the cattle need today? And uh, there's that, that utter life in the moment. Uh, and we spent time with them and danced with them and, and really enjoyed that. So happiness is less about possessions. The more uh, There's that old saying, more money, more problems. You know, more possessions, the more things you got to worry about. It's about your ability to be in a moment and really enjoy that moment for whatever it is. Not all moments are positive. Not all moments are fun. Every single one of us, at some point, the people we love and care about are going to disappear including us. We all die, you know, and as you get older, you know, people start getting cancer and heart attacks and, you know, they, they get killed in accidents and stuff happens. Uh, you, I watched the very same grandfather who jumped out of planes and was a brilliant doctor and he was just a hell of a guy get Alzheimer's. And it went from he was having trouble to he couldn't remember his name to he couldn't remember his own son and grandson. We were strangers to him. It was exceedingly hard to watch that degeneration of people around. So not every moment is is great, but finding something meaningful in those moments, I think is the key to happiness in life. And, and if you can do that, that is the abundance of wealth. There's a world in every flower in that respect. Um, what we've done in this world is we've convinced people that happiness is connected to things and the acquisition of things. And that's marketing. If you have the Rolex, you're a baller. If you have the Lamborghini, you're this. And these are fun. Sure, it's great. I, I own a lot of crazy shit. I own a Black Hawk helicopter. Go figure. God, that's fun. It's it's like the world's best experience, you know, flying around in that thing. You just feel like you're the baddest. Ass. But, you know, if it came down to it, you know, would you trade it for something else? Or if something happened and you lost it, would it destroy or damage your hat? No. You know, things come and go. I've been broke and and rich and you know, it doesn't matter at all. What sustains me is is just the fact that I get to do amazing things every day and, and interact with elite people. And we actually have a fair shot at leaving the world a slightly better place than how we found it. Uh, and whatever my lot in life was, I'm just as motivated today at this state as I was when I was living in a cramped apartment struggling to pay the bills, you know, and, and doing consulting gigs on the side just to be able to uh, get enough money to pay rent. I'm just as happy today as I was then and vice versa. I really enjoy what we do in, in that respect. So I think that's the key to, to a meaning in life and, and richness is can you look back at the life you've lived, the things you've done, find peace in that and say that more often than not, you were in the moment. More often than not, you really did enjoy the things that happened. Because you lose it all at the end, no matter how rich you are. You can go to Andrew Carnegie's grave. You can go to Rockefeller's grave. You can go to Getty's grave. They were all powerful people, all huge wealth and influence. They're all gone, and everything they have is gone. So you don't get to take it with you. So, you know, this uh, leads me to, to what I would call the grand finale of, of, of our conversation, Charles. And, um, yeah, I, I hope I'm going to, because whenever I, I, I do this, I, I tear off. You know, some people get inspiration in cafes, in, in, in busy places, others uh, by uh, shore or uh, on top of a mountain, in nature. You recently... Uh, went on a sideland retreat and uh, shared your amazing experience in your blog, blog which uh, concluded with uh, a call for love, which I would like to read. And I had a cathartic effect when I read it, I have to say, and so I do not know what's going to happen now when I read it, but I have to read it because it is something uh, which to me revealed the authentic Charles, which I think this is what we're talking about. Yes, so what what does it mean to be rich? For me, this paragraph at the end of your blog says everything about the wealth that Charles brings to the world. The final thought is one on love. There is a poem from Hafez that perfectly captures what mindfulness pursues. Even after all this time, the sun doesn't tell to the earth, you owe me. 
Look what happens with a love like this. It lights the whole sky. And then Charles goes and says, I do hope that time I spent in the mountains will give me my moments back and with them work that can light the whole sky. And now be saying, I think <laughs> there is not much more to say. We got into the core of Charles' soul and my whole life is richer and brighter for it. Thank you, Charles, for being in this world right now. I appreciate that, you know, and uh, it, it still is difficult for me to take praise. Uh, it's, uh, it's just crazy how narratives can be constructed. There's so many people that believe I'm this super egotistical, narcissistic person, and they, they confirmation bias anything that they can find. But uh, I oftentimes actually try to stay in the backdrop and uh, not not really invite or admire the praise. I, and it, it's, it still has something that makes me a little uncomfortable at times. I mean, I talk a lot and I do enjoy being the center of attention from time to time. It's, uh, you know, it's the Italian side of me. I can't get away from that. It's your authentic self. <laughs> That's what matters. Yeah, at the end of the day, I, I always say like, look, this is a collective journey that we're all on. And as I learn something, I love sharing that that wisdom, or at least what I perceive to be wisdom, with the rest of the world, because then if I make all everybody else better, we get better traveling companions. If you teach a person how to light a fire, then every time you go and camp, they can light the fire. You don't have to do it. So make everybody traveling with you as competent, skilled, or well-equipped as possible, and you'll have a better overall experience as you kind of go through the finiteness of, uh, of life. And, you know, the other thing is that we, there's this concept of false humility. Like, for example, I often say, oh, I'm a, well, I am a billionaire. And people, oh, you shouldn't say that. It's like, well, I'm just acknowledging that I happen to be in this particular class. Yes, and he acknowledged you know? too. <laughs> That's yes. my whole point. Yes. And, and it's not like oh, I'm bragging, I'm above all of you people. I'm just saying, well, you know, I, I am in a position in life where I have the resources to do pretty much anything I aspire to do. Uh, so it's then a question of, well, what should I aspire to do? And we are going on this collective journey together. And what I've done is I've put that wealth towards changing the world in this particular way. And maybe we get it, maybe we don't. But th that's my point about this, is that I don't have to be here. I could be sitting on a beach drinking Mai Tais and so forth, but I'm in the, I'm in the arena, like uh, Teddy Roosevelt used to say. You know, I'm taking my lumps. I'm fighting every day. So there's something worthwhile here. You know, there's this old saying of, uh, you know, your passions and your dreams are the things that you choose to do, not the things that you have to do. And so many of us are in a position in life where we have to do a lot of stuff. We don't have a lot of say or control because we're just scraping by in life. And I'm in a position where I now just choose to do everything. There's no have to do's in that situation. So I choose to be here. I choose to do these things. And I enjoy them because I think ultimately they lead to the, the best outcome. Yes, and, and just, you know, uh, my, my, my humble comments on this, because uh, also this kind of links with um, how you describe yourself in your blog. I'm, I'm that guy who writes and makes lots of people angry, something like that. <laughs> that, was, that was really, which, it, which, is, which reflects the complexity of the, the mission, right? It comes with the territory. If you want to change the world, you will make a lot of people angry. And if you point to the truth, and to, to things which are uncomfortable, you will make a lot of people ang angry. And this is what I really appreciate about you, Charles. You have the courage to actually stand up and call things for themselves, for what they are. And there's not there are not many left in the complacency <laughs> world uh, who really even can collect themselves to, to see the truth, but to state it so bravely as you do. So I just wanted to say that I so much appreciate you being here and... Uh, and all your work, and indeed, you could do anything else, but you are here. Well, actually, I have a question for you. So who's your next guest? I mean, where do you want to take the podcast? It's, this is kind of the, uh, the, first, uh, the first episode, but you know, what's the definition of success for, uh, for this podcast over the next year? This is the IOG Impact Podcast. So actually, what we want to do with this podcast is to feature projects which are actually illustrating the mission of our company which is to evolve the systems of the world in order to enable people to take full control of their lives, which is actually your mission, Charles, which you stated it from the very beginning. 
So um, my next guest will be one of these projects. It would be maybe unfair to name one of them right now, right? So let me surprise you. But this is, okay. this is definitely our mission here, and it is aligned, absolutely aligned with the mission of our company. Well, I'll, I'll definitely send some people your way. I'd love for you to interview Hildy from Possession in particular. She's, she's a really remarkable woman, uh, but there's plenty of people. I think uh, once this gets rolling, it's going to be a, a lot of fun, and I'm definitely going to be a longtime viewer uh, and listener of the, uh, of the podcast. And now I will leave you with Charles' words. I would hope the better angels of our nature will prevail, to quote Steven Pinker. I believe in the best in people, and I believe that people, if they're inspired and given an opportunity to be their best, will become that. And so, I believe that the tools of liberty and freedom can be used to solve the challenges which are much worse in the 21st century than, I would argue, even in the 20th century.